Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, show number 47. Welcome to a real world MBA from the School of Hard Knocks, where entrepreneurs reveal what it really takes to make it. Whether you're already in business or you're on your way there, this show is for you. This is Bigger Pockets Business. Hey there, everybody. I am Jay Scott. I am your co-host for the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. And this week, I'm actually your host for the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. Carol Scott has the week off, but she will be back next week. This week, we have a somewhat of a special show for you. So I know a lot of us are dealing with the coronavirus, the COVID-19 crisis, both personally and in our business. So we have brought on a gentleman named Andrew Sherman. He is an attorney. He's a business school professor. He is a prolific author of 26 books on pretty much every topic related to business. And we brought him on. We've recorded this show yesterday, March 16th, 2020, uh, to talk about what is going on in both the economy and uh, the business atmosphere and what we can do as business owners, either current business owners or prospective business owners to kind of protect ourselves and deal with this crisis as best we can. Now, like I said, we recorded this episode yesterday, March 16th. That was right after the Federal Reserve cut interest rates to about 0%. It was right after the Federal Reserve released about $700 billion of money into the economy, what we often call quantitative easing or QE. That's where the uh, the government essentially, for lack of a better term, prints a bunch of money and releases it into the economy to keep things moving along. In this episode, Andrew and I talk about a bunch of things. We talk about the outlook for the economy both short-term and long-term. We talk about what we as business owners should be doing today uh, to help our businesses survive the current crisis over the next few weeks and months. We talk a little bit about what we can be doing today and in the near future to better prepare our businesses in case we have a crisis like this again. And at some point we will. So preparing our businesses and figuring out a risk mitigation plan for our business is so important. And finally, we talk about what those of us who are looking to start a business in the near future, who have been thinking about starting a business, thinking about maybe buying a business in the near future, what we can do to better prepare for starting or buying a business in the future. This is a great episode. Again, very timely, just recorded yesterday. I hope you find it useful. If you want to find out more information about Andrew, about the things we talk about in this this episode, please check out our show notes at biggerpockets.com slash biz show 47. Again, that's biggerpockets.com slash biz show 47. Now, without any further ado, let's jump into my discussion with Andrew Sherman. How are you doing today, Andrew? Well, uh, amid the chaos, I'm trying to stay calm. Well, we really appreciate having you here. As we talked about in the introduction, you are a man of many expertise um, from law to business to economics. So this is tremendous that you're willing to be here today, and we really appreciate your time. Let's start with the fact that uh, just last night, the Federal Reserve cut interest rates down to essentially zero. Uh, QE is officially back in, in on the table. Uh, They've released $700 billion in QE into the economy uh, between the repo markets and treasuries. What are your thoughts on how the how the Fed has been handling, uh, basically over the last year, all these rate cuts and essentially getting prepared for a recession before a recession had even occurred? Yeah, I'm a little bit of a mixed mind on this one. On the one hand, I want to see our Fed competitive with the central banks of other jurisdictions. And I know the president has been more than vocal in expressing uh, the Fed being in alignment. At the same time, we've had now two unexpected emergency out of the blue Fed cuts. It's taken the markets by surprise. Uh, the Dow, as we're speaking live, is down 1,800 points. NASDAQ was down as high as 2,500. I think the financial markets, part of that is coronavirus, as we'll get into in a few minutes. Part of that is uh, the oil, um, you know, upheaval and the uh, uh, tension between Saudi Arabia and Russia. But the markets are clearly wanting to see a bit more of a process out of the Fed and maybe a bit more warning. I think they like the proactivity on the one hand. 
uh, but they like the process on the other. And they're nervous, as all people are, is does the Fed know something that we don't know? Uh, does the federal government know something that we don't know? Uh, does Anthony Fauci know something that we don't know? And so it's all of that wondering that leaves America's entrepreneurs and small business owners and, frankly, even big business uh, leaders, um, you know, in sort of that fear of the unknown and, and, and panic mode. Yeah, there, there's a lot of talk recently about whether this could be a what's referred to as a V-shape uh, downturn, meaning we have a sharp downturn. And then once the virus issues are resolved and, and we can kind of get the economy back on track, we can get people working again, we can get businesses producing again, um, we, we potentially see a, a kind of a V-shape straight upwards and things are, are back to normal. Other people are saying that, no, this, is, this could be a, a lot more long and drawn out. We have the risk of layoffs, people starting to default on their debt because we have consumer and corporate debt at an all-time high, and then this potentially being a really long-term uh, downturn or recession. What are your thoughts there? Any, any, any ideas yeah, on where this so, might go? So the classic uh, analogy is a U-shape versus a V-shape, and if it's going to be a V-shape, how sharp is the point? If it's going to be a U-shape, how elongated is the bottom? Um, if we look at the Dow right now, it's actually been a W shape. It's bouncing up and down like multiple V's all compressed together. And that's been sending a confusing message as well. My sense is that it's probably a U shape, not a V shape. I don't think we're going to get because of the nature of the coronavirus and the way that Fauci and others have been talking about flattening the bump. You know, we want to flatten the curve of the number of incidences, uh, but that curve is just trying to get lower than the spike they saw in China. It's not going to be eliminated. I don't see, though, a, a super elongated bottom at the at, of the U. So I wouldn't expect it to be a, a V-shaped spike, but I don't think we're looking at some you know, 20 years of recession as Japan experienced. I think it's going to take a while, as we'll discuss today, for small business owners to recover from the pain they've already incurred and the pain that they're about to incur if they're not well prepared. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And and one of the things that, that sticks with me is I, I'm old enough to remember 9-11 and how we had a uh, pretty decent size shut down when that happened. Airlines were shut down. Uh, tourism kind of fell off the map. People didn't want to travel. They didn't want to congregate in large groups. They were concerned about terrorism. That lasted a few weeks, even a month or two, but it was nothing compared to what we're seeing today in terms of businesses shutting down, uh, cities shutting down, people not leaving their homes, uh, tourism basically uh, got cut to zero. And back in 2001, I mean, we saw... Um, GDP contract two, three, four percent. 2008, which we didn't see any type of shutdown like we're seeing, we saw GDP contract to eight percent or down eight percent. Um, where do you presume that we're headed in terms of GDP? Do you think this is, could be one of those events where we literally in Q1, Q2 see negative 10, negative 12 percent GDP? Or do you think the numbers aren't going to be as bad as some are forecasting? No, I think they'll be in the single digits. I think, look, there's a lot of businesses that have opportunity here uh, to adjust. And, you know, look, let, let, let's take a micro example that's near and dear to both of our hearts as fellow Maryland Terps fans. OK, I have a client that's a chain of sports bars. He told me the other day that a good 40 to 50 percent of his revenue for the year for the year comes from March Madness. You know, that is beyond uh, any other sports event. And because of its two and a half week length, you know, it's almost a party every night. Um, and particularly if the teams that you love are in it. So for him, March Madness doesn't happen again for 12 more months. There's no way to recreate March Madness. Now, you could, and we'll get into this, I think, in a bit, you could do creative ideas, you could do a a, a faux March Madness. You could pretend there's March Madness. You could run, uh, if it's legal in your state, online betting around it. You could do video game equivalents. I mean, you can get creative, but it's just not the same. There's no way for him to replace that uh, revenue stream and sales until March Madness comes back. And so if, it's, if it is a U-shaped recovery, and if you're taking a GDP hit, some of the things that he's counting on to replace that revenue will come back, but, you know, arguably won't come back for 
10 and a half, 11 more months, uh, at least till the regional tournaments. And, um, you know, what is he going to do to replace those revenues or replace the loss of cash flow? Uh, that, and so if you take that and now multiply it out by tens of thousands of businesses, I think you'll, you'll, you, you come to a conclusion around a single digit GDP hit uh, in all likelihood. Okay. So I guess that's good news. And from what I'm hearing is um, small business owners at this point shouldn't necessarily be thinking about shutting down, going home for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. Instead, they should be figuring out ways that they can pivot their business so that they can continue to generate income, even if it's not the same income that they were previously planning on generating, but they keep things going. Is this also an opportunity for business owners to carve out new business models or to create new service offerings that either can help them now during this, this event, but also potentially down the road stuff. They do stuff now that they can later capitalize on when this all is over. Yeah. So that's an excellent question. Let's take an industry that's been hit and will be hit very, very hard. You know, the restaurant industry, retail industry, um, just last night, the mayors of both LA and New York shut down restaurants, clubs, uh, cinemas, unless it was carry out or delivery, right? So let's take your example. Let's say I'm a restaurant that really hasn't done much carry out or delivery. I obviously have to shift my business model if I want to stay open to carry out and delivery. But the problem is, and this is the main message I want your listeners today to absorb and think about, and I pray that they are better prepared for next time. If you're a restaurant that's been doing takeout and delivery for years, it's no big shift in your model to ramp that up. You've got the database, you have the customer expectation, you have the loyalty, you have the delivery systems. But imagine that you're a New York restaurant that just got the proclamation from the mayor last night and you've never done takeout or delivery. It's a little late out of the game to suddenly try and reach your customers and get them thinking that way, to get the delivery systems right, the packaging right. Everyone needs new packaging now because they're concerned about uh, coronavirus. So I think the businesses that were already engaged in alternative business models that lend themselves to a crisis have five, 10, even 15 steps ahead of the businesses that are coming unprepared. And really that, I hope if there's one silver lining inside this coronavirus scare, it's that we are all, all of us, personally, uh, professionally, business-wise, more prepared for the next crisis than we were for this one. Because I have to tell you, uh, at so many levels, from our federal, state, and local governments, uh, to businesses and entrepreneurs, to big business, we were about as unprepared for this as I've ever seen. And like you, I've been through 9-11. I've been through the 80s uh, meltdown. I've been through 08, 09. You know, there have been a, there have been a lot of, of spikes and declines in, in our economics, but this one has both a health scare to it and an economic scare. And while I commend uh, our emergency responders and our governments for trying to play catch up. We're playing catch up and it's, it's obvious to our citizenry and it's obvious to the rest of the world that the greatest country on earth is scrambling to play catch up in uh, response to a virus, to, to this virus. And I think that um, I, I really do hope that we'll be much, much better prepared in the future. So let's talk about that that risk management, that planning for for a downturn, preparing for uh, um, unanticipated events. Uh, I come from a corporate background, and I talk a lot about doing risk management, about doing risk planning, about thinking about what your worst case scenarios are, and having mitigation plans in in place for them. But something like this is such a black swan. And, and when I say black swan, I just mean a, a once in a lifetime, once in a hundred year, once in a really long period event that's very difficult to plan for. Are you suggesting that even small business owners should be planning for events like this? And to what degree should we be spending our time planning for for unanticipated risks versus spending time building our businesses and, and taking advantage of, of, of things when they're good? Well, it's a very astute question. And look, you can't spend all of your time, particularly during booming economic times, planning for the worst. Most entrepreneurs aren't even, you know, their DNA wiring is not, is not the type of mindsets that when things are going well, it's hard for them to, to even think about bad stuff happening or bad stuff happening as suddenly 
as coronavirus has affected so many uh, companies. So you're right. But but what we also have, you know, I was interviewed by CNBC on this last week and the week before, ironically, I had, be, I had been interviewed not on coronavirus lack of planning, but uh, a different interview on lack of succession and transition planning among our America's small business and an aging baby boomer population. And that I identified as just as big of a crisis. And then, of course, we had a real crisis to layer on top of that. So I think it's it's getting in a mindset. Uh, I called it Ponce de Leon syndrome, you know, thinking that we're going to live forever, thinking that there will be no more black swans. Um, I do think that small business owners, entrepreneurs, big businesses, they owe it to their ecosystem, to their employees, to their customers, to their supply chains, to their distri distribution partners, to be thinking about the worst, to assume that things like this may happen again. Uh, there are, is already starting to be some science that, you know, something at the level of coronavirus may not be a black swan, a black swan per se. It might be more of a, a gray swan, something that could occur every five years or 10 years, and we're going to have to adjust to the new normal. Um, some businesses were more prepared for telecommuting and telework than others. Um, some industries lend themselves much better. Um, you know, I myself am just getting up to speed on Zoom uh, to be with you today and to teach my online courses at Georgetown Law School for the rest of the semester. I mean, I admit myself to not being as ready as I could be, uh, but, you know, I'll spend a good part of my evening and tomorrow morning uh, moving from Zoom novice to Zoom expert because tomorrow afternoon I have 65 students waiting for me to deliver a lecture and I don't want to let them down. So I think there's just a lot of little things that we can do to be more ready. That's great. And, and I want to talk a whole lot more about the telecommuting and the working from home and the shift that we are potentially going to see based on what's happening today. Before I do that, you mentioned uh, earlier a responsibility to employees, a responsibility to vendors. A big question that I'm getting asked a lot these days by small business owners is how do you how do you draw that balance between trying to um, take care of all of your employees versus taking care of your business. I've had several business owners ask me flat out, um, should I be considering layoffs or should I be kind of layering or, or flattening things out so that the business is potentially making less money, but I'm still keeping people on, even if I have to cut their hours, even if, if I have to cut their wages, what's the strategic thinking there for small business owners in terms of, of how they address laying people off versus just kind of cutting everybody's hours and, and, and kind of spreading the pain around, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So think of it as three buckets. Uh, bucket number one is when Ted Leonsis, uh, who owns the Capitals and the Wizards, or Mark Cuban, who owns the Mavericks, steps up and says, you know, while the stadiums are shut down, I will be paying the salaries of all of the stadium workers and the people that lay the floor and change it from a basketball to an ice hockey stadium and the hundreds of people that, you know, beyond their control are basically out of work until uh, the season start or the wonderful gestures by athletes over the weekend to cover some of those salaries, which makes you wonder how come the owners were not. Um, anyway, that's bucket one. That is just this amazing goodwill gesture by business owners that says, don't worry, I've got your back. But these are also people of very significant means and they can afford to run a month or a month and a half of payroll. And yes, it's painful. And yes, it's uh, completely altruistic on their part and it's a wonderful thing to do, but very few businesses can really afford uh, to, to offer that benefit. Yesterday, I was on the call with a much smaller company, a uh, company down the Southeast that, that may need to uh, look at layoffs, is wondering how to handle the reduced cash flow. Uh, they're looking at creative strategies like three-day week work, work weeks or four-day work weeks or, you know, partial pay, uh, partial days, uh, you know, rotating. You know, they're looking at almost every mathematical equation so that some income will be coming into their employees. The third bucket is, of course, the role of the federal, state, and local government. Uh, you already saw some announcements last Friday, legislation being passed by the House. Hopefully, the Senate will sign off. The president promises that he will sign. That's providing relief to certain types of uh, hospitality, retail, travel businesses. And look, you know, no matter what your politics, you don't want to rely on the federal government to be the ultimate answer to everything. Otherwise, we're looking at very significant spikes in taxes for all of us, 
and we also were never set up to be a society that relies on the federal government to bail out everybody and, and, and everyone every time something like this happens. So it's a delicate policy balance between how much can business owners foot the bill how can small business owners where layoffs are going to be inevitable, you know, do right by their employees and also do right by their customers. And then the third bucket is how much do you want to get relief for uh, these layoffs? And this goes back to your V versus U shape. You know, if it's a V shape or a shortened U shape, government can withstand that and not go out of business. Um, and the government can help as can small businesses. If this U shape gets elongated, or Fauci and his team are unable to suppress the curve of coronavirus cases, we really could see uh, pressures on resources together with, back to what you said, uh, double ne neg uh, double digit negative GDP growth, which could take us a lot longer to dig out of, especially at a time where we have an election coming up this fall, potential change in policy and administration and leadership, which you know is gonna be disruptive no matter what. Yeah. And you mentioned something there in your in your three buckets. In the third bucket, you talked about government and, and how long term reliance on the government isn't good for anybody. Uh, but in a major crisis like this, basically, uh, we've gotten to the point where the Fed is to a large extent uh, to, to quote the cliche out of ammo. Um, interest rates are, are basically zero. Uh, we, we could print a lot more money, but then we run the risk of inflation. So we may be out of, of, um, of fiscal policy um, options to really kind of stem what's going on. The next obvious move is kind of legislation through Congress where um, basically we figure out how to provide um, subsidy or benefit directly to business owners, directly to consumers. Do you have any thoughts on where that might be headed, what the government might be thinking about doing or might do in the in the coming months to kind of help the economy along now that the Fed is, is pretty much out of ammunition? Yeah, I think we over focus on the Fed sometimes. Um, somebody said the other day, you know, even with the interest rates down to essentially a quarter of one point, um, you know, if someone fears uh, catching coronavirus, they're not going out on Saturday to buy a new car just because there's a <laughs> the interest rate is a quarter point less, or if their current car is working fine, or if they're not driving their car at all for the next 30 days, the urgency to buy the car uh, may not be there. Now, maybe that consumer will come back in the fall and buy that car. So will that interest rate really make a marginal measurable difference in their life compared to, you know, the difference between fiscal and monetary policy? I don't know that that, that the Fed, like you said, has too many more weapons available to it compared to using SBA loan programs, uh, emergency you know, training, um, loans of hardware to allow more people to work at home if companies don't have the hardware that they need. Um, there's a lot of other tools in the toolkit that are available um, in a, it, it, more in a uh, non-Fed policy perspective because we, you know, the press likes to overfocus on the Fed, uh, the administration overfocuses on the Fed. And, you know, frankly, last night, the Fed did what the government, uh, what the White House asked it to do. And the markets have been anything but reassured by that move. I mean, they continue to be down very heavily as we speak. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that's interesting in this particular downturn, and we talk about uh, risk management and contingency planning, um, but one of the things that we tend to think about when we think about uh, economic risks is we think about that demand side slowdown. We think about um, people are losing their jobs, unemployment's going up, people stop spending, um, therefore businesses obviously are slowing down, not making as much money. But in this case, we actually have something on the other side. We have a supply side constraint as well. We have China that can't necessarily manufacture the, the materials that we need for, for our business. We, we aren't necessarily getting either the raw materials or the finished materials we need to stock our shelves. Do you see the supply side issues and the supply side constraints that we're seeing today um, to be a long-term issue in, in this next whatever's to come in the economy? Or do you think that's something that's going to resolve itself fairly quickly? I think it'll resolve itself fairly quickly. There, there are definitely some supply chain issues that are, concern me uh, relative to access to prescription medicines that might be made in China. But frankly, I'd be looking right now at supply chain issues out of Europe. China seems to be already 
slightly on the path to recovery. People are back into manufacturing plants. I think that will continue. They seem to be, they seem to be emphasize the word seem on the other side of, of, of Fauci's curve. Whereas uh, Italy, Spain, if you had things that you were relying on coming out of Europe, uh, that's smack in the middle of that bell curve. I'm not sure that, that that's going to happen anytime soon. But, you know, we do seem to have uh, more than adequate supply of, of everything. I just this morning was in a CVS and they basically were fully stocked other than, of course, hand sanitizer. Uh, they even had toilet paper, uh, just in case anyone's still <laughs> short on that. Um, but, you know, it's it's just odd. I was in the supermarket on Sunday and again, you know, beautiful produce and fresh foods and all kinds of things. And then you get to the toilet paper aisle and it was empty. And I thought, you know, geez, there's just a, a, a human cycle problem here. There's lots of food and no toilet paper. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I do think that the supply chain should be monitored carefully. Now, I'll give you a different example of a client of mine out on the West Coast. They are feeling very flush right now because they do get a lot of their inventory from China. They said that their current inventory levels are higher than the norm, and that is a benefit as they sell through that inventory. Of course, it could be a liability if consumer demand drops. A lot of the products that they sell aren't really things you have to have. They're, they're kind of you know, things that you might like to have to entertain yourself. Although I guess if we're all stuck at home for weeks at a time, maybe that demand will go up. Now, what they weren't sure is when they sell through that inventory, how quickly they'll be able to replace it. So uh, it was definitely a, a supply chain moving target and he's doing his best to manage it. And he's hoping that, you know, as his inventory level goes down, the China supply chain improves. But, you know, uh, all joking aside, I mean, if you were counting on key supplies for your business from Italy, from Spain, uh, from, you know, any parts of Europe right now, I think you, you're, you're in for a while before you see a container coming through. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the things I, I've, I've noticed in my old age, and, and I'm getting there. So I've been through a couple of these. And one of the things I've noticed is that we have an event like the tech bubble, like 9-11, like 2008. And we look back 5, 10, 20 years afterwards, and we realize that the world has sort of changed based on that event in ways that were, for the most part, unpredictable when it originally happened. And, and just as an example, we see everybody starting to work from home today, so reasonable prediction that maybe in five or 10 or 20 years, we see this shift from people coming into the office to do jobs that could otherwise be done at home to more people starting to work at home and seeing a shift in that direction. What types of shifts do you potentially see resulting in the next five, 10, 20 years based on this particular event? Well, I, I've got, you know, a, a couple of different answers for you there. Um, if you, if you look at social media, there are some pretty funny posts about, you know, our ability to have advanced quantum computers and send people to the moon and into space. And we're just now getting around to the fact that we should be washing our hands regularly. I mean, you know, so it, when you when you hear, you know, a White House press conference and the smartest people in our entire planet are telling us the main things not to do is to is to not wash our hands and to use hand sanitizer if you can find it. I don't know that that's a behavioral change that is significant. Then there's a, another segment of the population that's looking at the politicians and looking at the media and going, yeah, this is another Y2K. You remember Y2K. I mean, our entire ecosystem, our technology, everything was going to blow up. It was going to reset. We were all going to be without the internet. And then the next morning was like, really, that was a lot of, of smoke about nothing. And I, I think you've got this, um, you know, rugged individualism and skepticism that one of the things that Fauci was trying to communicate or and over communicate over the weekend was this really, really is serious. This is not Y2K. This is not a hoax. Uh, but people are still probably taking it with a bit of grain of salt and how much this will change their behavior. You know, I, I walked by uh, both very crowded and uncrowded uh, restaurants on my way in this morning. So it seems that, you know, it is affecting short term behavior. We are social beings. Uh, we don't like being away from each other for a particularly long time. And I don't see this uh, significantly changing consumer behavior. I do think that 
there will be little things. Um, if, if, you know, we live in the city, uh, we have limited storage, uh, might we, you know, look at having a little bit more storage for next time around? Things, things like that will change consumer behaviors, uh, but I don't think it's going to change it too significantly other than hopefully we'll all be a little more uh, hygiene conscious. How about on the supply side? Do you see currently much of our trade, and not not an over, I think it's like 4% of, of total trade is coming out of China, um, but we rely on China for a lot of things that um, if something like this happens, puts our country at risk. Do you see those supply chains changing? Do you see additional redundancy being put in place by some businesses? Do you see uh, trade moving from China to other parts of the world, perhaps Mexico, for example? Where do you think that, what, what impact do you think this is going to have on trade and, and supply chain and our relationship with China? Yeah, I, if I were Mexico uh, right now, I would be heavily promoting economic development, access to manufacturing resources. I mean, the proximity of Mexico, uh, you know, if we, we, we've taken steps to kind of shore up the border and we we're working on uh, better immigration policies, you know, I would be definitely promoting myself as a potential manufacturing resource. But uh, the U.S. is has been dependent for some time uh, on overseas manufacturing, outsourcing, and whether that will shift just because of coronavirus, I don't know. I think that maybe it's the convergence of the trade wars and the coronavirus, and there being accusations that perhaps China has not made full disclosure with us as to how this all got started. I mean, it's going to be an an aggregate of variables because what you're talking about, and look, it's a, it's a fantastic question. You may be right, but you're talking about, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and billions of dollars of infrastructure being built and bringing our economy, even with smart manufacturing and robotics, you're still, you'd be shifting our economy back to something that it was 50 years ago instead of what it's become, which is a much more information and services based economy. The problem is, you know, personal services, uh, which, you know, I mean, who, who's really, you know, not canceling their appointment for their personal trainer or going to a gym right now, you know, there are large chunks of our economy that have become dependent on a human interaction and people going outside and people, uh, traveling to places, even if they're traveling via Uber or Lyft instead of in their own vehicles. And that's all being affected right now. I mean, I'm looking out my window, uh, looking down F Street, usually a very busy street uh, around lunchtime, and I see one person. One person. Yeah. Okay, let's do a quick shift to from from all the the negative and the and the mitigation and the risk to opportunities. So there are a lot of people in our audience that either are getting ready to start a business or have thought about starting a business. Now is probably for a lot of reasons not the best time to be starting a business, but if you do things intelligently, if you focus on recession resistant opportunities, maybe now is a good time to start putting those plans in place or maybe even launch something. So for those people out there that are considering launching a business in the near future, what should they be thinking about? How can they take advantage of what we're likely to see in the economy and the world over the next several months or years? Well, it's a, it's a fantastic question. So first of all, you know, let's define timetables. If you just are thinking about starting a business, I hope and pray that by the time you get your business plan written and you do your test markets of products and services that we're well past this. Because even if somebody very diligently started planning their business uh, in the spring, uh, it's not likely to launch until fall. And I think everyone hopes that by the fall, we'll at least be on the other end of that uh, Fauci curve that's being described. Now, if you've been planning a business and you were literally like going to launch this week and it was going to be, you know, a retail nail salon, uh, yeah, you may want to delay your grand opening. I don't know that anybody's going to be rushing out uh, for a manicure, pedicure in this environment. Um, you know, I've canceled my own pedicures on a permanent basis now. Uh, but, you know, that. It just depends in part, like you said, on the type of business, the timetable of the business. Is it retail versus non-retail? For example, if you're going to be doing a remote technology training business that included Zoom, uh, you probably have thousands of potential customers that are ready to go tomorrow. And if you weren't going to launch that business until the fall, um, quite frankly, you may want to think about launching it now. 
So the demand curves are going to be choppy depending on the nature of the business. The other thing you're going to see is remember that at any given time in our country, there's a million or two potential entrepreneurs who are thinking about starting a business, but then something in their life happens where they have no choice. You will have people losing their jobs. We are going to see a spike in our unemployment rate and our underemployment rate. And many of those people will turn to entrepreneurship and small business. They're going to say, hey, I'm done being an employee. I'm going to be a business owner. And so I do think that, you know, they always say that during a, a horrible crisis or economic downturn, we see more entrepreneurs born and more babies born uh, because people have more time to business plan and they have more time to spend in the bedroom. So I think we will see an uptick in babies and we will see an uptick in businesses born as well. Well, there you go. And there probably puppy adoptions. Who knows? <laughs> okay. There are some good opportunities there. So a topic that I know that you've written and talked about a whole lot is business financing. For those of us in our audience who didn't necessarily live through 2008 and didn't try and finance a business or, or generate some liquidity for their business back then, what should we be expecting to see, assuming that there's a downturn, assuming that we head into recession, assuming that, that banks start tightening up their lending, what should we be expecting in terms of, of, of financing for businesses, either new businesses or existing businesses, maintaining liquidity? And what should we be doing right now to prepare for any shifts in the, uh, in the, uh, the financing uh, market for our businesses? So we're, we're, this is hitting at a very interesting time. Um, the treasury cash buildups of the Fortune 100 were at the highest levels in the history of mankind. Companies like Apple were sitting on some ridiculous number, you know, 400 billion in cash. Um, Google, 300 billion in cash. I mean, I've never seen treasuries so stocked with cash uh, as big tech companies and other large companies had. Small companies, on the other hand, were operating with very little cash reserves. And so I don't want to sound too egalitarian here, but if I were a small company and I was running into a real cash flow issue, I would be trying to think of something, anything that I could tap into cash that is being held by the larger companies. Is there some product or service I can sell them? Is there something I can be prepaid for? Is there something I could get a deposit for? Because we don't have a shortage of cash. We have a shortage of distribution of cash and, you know, this is a great point that was made over the weekend. The biggest difference between 2008 and today is our banks are strong. Our banks are strong in response to the legislation that was passed and to Dodd-Frank. And to, so this is happening at a time when banks do have money to lend. Now, I do agree with you. They're not just going to give it away and create another 2008 repeat for 2021-22. But we are flush with cash. Banks have cash. Large companies have cash. A lot of mid-sized companies have cash. And we're just at a point where how do we get some of that cash redistributed in a, in a capitalistic entrepreneurial way uh, to small businesses that might not have cash reserves? It is not a great time to be raising equity capital. A lot of equity capital, venture capital, angel investors are all on the sidelines. I mean, imagine going to an angel club and pitching uh, to 20 angels who have watched their net worth go up and down by 10 and 20% just in the last two weeks. I mean, if I were an angel, I don't even know if I'd be going to the dinner until the capital market stabilized because that's where my wealth probably it resides right now. So, um, you know, venture capital, private equity, uh, if they're, th the problem is private equity smells blood in the water. And so while they might be willing to deploy cash, they know that smaller businesses may be desperate for cash. And of course, the cost of capital and the terms that go with that capital may not be uh, anything that's going to get your lawyer or accountants excited. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic answer. And as a, as a small angel investor myself, I've, I've definitely felt that and, and have, have, for the most part, written off a few of my investments in the short term. So 
definitely get that. How about those people out there that are considering buying a business? So I'm sure there are business owners right now who have been struggling and may see this as an opportunity to exit. Maybe they're getting older and see this as an opportunity to retire. Um, might this be a great time to be able to pick up a business really cheap that might not necessarily cash flow or thrive for the next year or two because of this downturn, but you have an opportunity to pick up something cheap and start to build up so that as we hit the next expansion or, or we recover, um, there, there's an opportunity. 100%. You know, my next call uh, after this podcast is with a gentleman. Uh, he's an established restaurant entrepreneur. He's in the process of trying to raise acquisition capital to buy some of the what will soon be troubled restaurant chains that are out there. Um, you know, he's got a grit and determinism and vision that um, is awfully strong right now. And, 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 you know, it's always been in our history that uh, if you are willing to take the risk of buying assets that are the most troubled, I mean, you know, if I had unlimited cash right now, I might buy a cruise line company. I might buy an airline. I mean, cruises is an interesting example. You know, with aging baby boomers, the amount of wealth that's been built up and the wealth that will be restored, I mean, you know, the 20-year forecast for the average cruise line has got to be through the roof, right, in terms of what they anticipate demand to be. But right now, of course, you know, I think you'd have to, you'd have to be a little bit crazy to, to go on a cruise. And so you'd say, is that a short-term, medium-term, long-term problem? When you do M&A and acquisitions, you're definitely buying for the medium to long-term. You're not buying for the short-term. And you might be able to catch a business owner off guard who, due to a health issue or a family issue or just general fear, is willing to sell at a much lower price than they would have you know, even three weeks ago or, or three months ago. Yeah. And, and the, the, the addendum to that is that there are a lot of business owners out there that are worried about how they're going to make their next mortgage payment or how they're going to make their next car payment and may be willing to sell on some type of seller financing. Basically you're providing them essentially an annuity. You're telling them, I'm going to pay you every month for the next year, two years, three years to get you through it in return for you essentially handing me over the assets of your business. So there could be an opportunity or a, a number of opportunities for small business owners to, to kind of exactly buy a remember yeah, please. Two things. I mean, in every M&A deal, merger and acquisition deal, there's price and there's terms. And price and valuation is one thing, but the terms that you pay and the terms that some people might be willing to accept for the very reasons that you just said is 100% spot on. The second thing, and I've, I've talked about this uh, on other podcasts and interviews uh, with the major media sources, is, look, we're having a, a natural aging of the baby boomers already happening right now where tens of thousands of business owners need and want to sell their businesses over the next three to five years. And sometimes it takes a shock like this that says, okay, you know what? I'm done. I've had enough. Uh, you know, I could go uh, another three to five years, but you know, I've been through enough business scares. I'm ready to sell. And so I do think that it's an opportunistic time. If you've been sitting on cash, um, to, to explore uh, the business market. And then the third component, which we talked about earlier, is you have all of those people that might lose their jobs, have a decent amount of 401k and savings. Uh, if you believe the markets will stabilize and your 401k account will eventually stabilize, you might want to buy a small business um, in lieu of going back to work or starting to look for a job if you've got the savings. And then that business could eventually uh, be passed on to your next generation. Andrew, this has been absolutely fantastic. We, I, I, and I'm sure my listeners very much appreciate your insights here, uh, your reassurances that this isn't the end of the world. Um, I, I would love to give you the opportunity to leave us with any final thoughts you have for, uh, uh, as business owners, as prospective business owners, what we should be doing or what we should be thinking. And then please tell us where we can find out more about you, where we can pick up any of your, I think it's 26 books, uh, or hear more about what you have to think on the topic. Well, thank you. Thank you for that um, wonderful feedback. Thank you for the invitation to, uh, to give a final comment. And thank you for uh, a 30 second commercial at the end, which I promise will be under 30 seconds. So uh, one, it's, you know, you are a fantastic host and it's been my pleasure to be on the show. And we got this all pulled together on very short notice. So I hope your listeners enjoy it. Um, number two, I think my final thought 
goes back to the conversation we had about halfway through this podcast. And that is, look, it is a natural feeling that when the economy is booming and unemployment is low and demand is high to just have fun. I mean, how fun was it last year to be a business owner with some of my clients having 40, 50, 60% growth, 20% spikes in profitability, brand new cars, great vacations. I mean, it's fun when things are going that well. And it's very hard to pull yourself out of that party and say, oh my God, you know, four months from now, we could have one of the, the greatest world health crises ever. Am I ready for that? But this is our stark and vivid reminder that there are going to be good times and there are going to be bad times. And you can soften the blow of the bad times if you do a little planning, put away a little cash. I mean, imagine small business owners that had a great 2019 that put some of those retained earnings away into an emergency account instead of buying his and hers matching Maseratis, how smart do they look right now, right, to, to, to weather this storm and to get through it? And, you know, we've just got to have discipline. There's a great new TV ad right in right now for Volkswagen where the guy from Billions, it plays an accountant to rich people. And the, his client is some famous celebrity and he's traveling all over the world and spending all kinds of money. And then he says, but I just bought a Volkswagen. And the CPA is so relieved that he's finally trying to save some money somewhere. And that's what this is like. I mean, you know, I hope every one of your listeners thrives and, and, and has great business years. But during those years, putting something away for the emergency is important. So that would be my parting thought. Um, I think that's so important. As far as uh, getting a hold of me, uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, Google knows how to find me. Uh, all the books and the speeches and the podcasts and everything are, are readily available. Uh, our website here at the law firm is www.sifarth. That's S E Y. F-A-R-T-H.com. All my contact information is on there. And you were kind enough to mention my books. The um, Amazon author page uh, for Andrew J. Sherman has all the books on there. And look, if you're going to be at home for the next few weeks, uh, what better time to order a couple of books on Amazon and get yourself up to speed on things? There's lots, you know, I, I think that is one, sorry, if you don't mind, one last thing. You know, if we are all quarantined at home for a couple of weeks, there's a part of me that's going to be very, very frustrated and very uh, concerned about my clients and everything else. There's a small part of me that's going to be relieved. I, I don't know that I've been home for two weeks in 33 years. You know, I, I played gin with my wife the other night. You know, we've been married 35 years. I don't think we've ever played gin or not since the first year of marriage. I mean, there's some things that we can all do. Uh, I saw a, a young man who must have been off work. This was already 9.30, quarter of 10. He was racing his daughter up and down R Street on her bike, and he was running. And so he was getting his wind sprints in and spending time with his three-year-old uh, daughter who looks like she just learned to ride a bike. I mean, you know, let's let's take advantage of this time because when the economy comes roaring back, and it will, uh, we're going to wish for these two weeks or three weeks back. Um, so that would be probably my final, final parting thoughts. Andrew, thank you so much. For all of our listeners, go check out our show notes. All the links that Andrew mentioned will be in the show notes, including links to his books, links to his uh, attorney website, cyforth.com, and links to a whole bunch of other things. Andrew, again, we really appreciate this. And honestly, I would love to have you back when kind of we're out of emergency mode and we can talk about something a little bit more mundane in the business world and, and, and less, uh, less, maybe less exciting, but, uh, but still super important to our listeners. I would love to do a part two. We can, we can do a whole analysis on next year's Maryland Terp season, if you like. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Andrew, we'll thank take you so care. much. You as well. Have a great day. Stay safe. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in this week. That episode hopefully was enlightening, hopefully provided some ideas for those of us who are navigating this crisis through their business or are looking to be starting a business in the future. Everybody, for both myself, for Carol Scott, for everybody at Bigger Pockets, we wish you a very happy and a very healthy next week. Stay safe, and we will be back next week. Thank you again so much for tuning in. Mm -hmm.